Have you ever heard a song and felt as if the singer was talking about you? You hear some song about love, loss, heartbreak, getting back on your feet, etc. And something about it speaks to you implicitly. Maybe the songwriter chose the exact words you wrote in your diary nights ago. Maybe the song feels incredibly reminiscent of a discussion you had with a parental figure in your life. Or maybe the circumstances they're writing about run parallel to something that you had just gone through, but you couldn't quite put the words to it. The feeling that one gets when that occurs is incredible. You feel less alone in the world, like someone, somewhere, knows exactly what you've been going through, and sees you, and has gone through this before. It feels comforting and safe. Sometimes, it can even feel like the artist had a spyglass looking into our lives, although logically, we know that isn't the case. Or at least, we should know that. With the advent of social media, the emotional distance between the average person and a celebrity has nearly vanished. You can be notified when your favorite actor tweets, making it feel as if they're texting you their random thoughts throughout the day. And you can watch your favorite singer's Instagram stories, where they post their video outtakes and their personal life, which makes you feel like you really know them. And you can, at times, talk to your favorite celebrity, with them actually responding to your thoughts and opinions. Though this person doesn't know you from anyone else, you feel as if you know them, and that can lead to your expectations of that celebrity being much higher. If they tweet something that upsets you, it's harder to shake off, and you find yourself getting more and more upset about it as time goes on. If they hang out with someone who you personally do not like, you find yourself wanting to step in, telling them to cut that person out of their life because you, a stranger, knows what's best for them. And if they don't heed your warning, and they continue to do things that you feel are not what's best for them, you find yourself getting unreasonably upset and eventually breaking up with them, so to speak. In modern times, this reaction to a celebrity has become incredibly prevalent and has been dubbed a parasocial relationship, which some have argued is a form of erotomania and, like most things, can be dangerous. Erotomania, also known as the Clarembault syndrome or delusional love, is a rare psychiatric disorder characterized by a delusional belief that another person, usually someone of higher social status, is deeply in love with the individual experiencing the delusion. The person with erotomania firmly believes that they are the object of intense affection, despite any evidence to the contrary. This belief persists even when it is implausible or impossible. The exact cause of erotomania is not fully understood. However, it is believed to be associated with underlying psychiatric conditions such as schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, and major depressive disorder. Some researchers suggest that erotomania may result from abnormalities in the brain regions involved in processing emotion and interpreting social cues, leading to misinterpretation of signals from others. Individuals with erotomania may construct elaborate fantasies around their delusion, assuming that the person they believe is in love with them is sending secret messages or gestures to confirm their feelings. They might misinterpret benign actions, such as a smile or a wave, as evidence of love or devotion. Despite repeated rejections or lack of reciprocation, those with erotomania maintain their delusion and may resort to stalking or intrusive behaviors in an attempt to establish a connection with the object of their affection. The delusions experienced by people with erotomania can be categorized into two main types, primary and secondary. In primary erotomania, the delusion arises spontaneously, without any prior personal or social relationship with the individual they believe is in love with them. Secondary erotomania, on the other hand, occurs when the delusion is based on a pre-existing relationship, such as a casual encounter or a brief interaction. Welcome back to another episode of Dreading, or if this is your first time here, welcome. Today we are going to be going over the case of Rebecca Lucille Schaefer. We will be going over the case details as well as Robert John Bardo's own statements in order to showcase how easily lines can be blurred between delusion and reality. This video was once again recommended by one of our longtime viewers who felt like a case like this should be discussed on this channel, which I personally agree with. With that being said, if you find yourself enjoying the video or wanting to see more, consider subscribing. And if you're in the position, please support us via Patreon. As always, if there's a video you would like to see or a case you would like to bring more attention to, consider emailing me at dreading.official at gmail.com. I'm currently researching a plethora of recommendations, and I'm always looking for more. With all of that said, let us begin. Rebecca Lucille Schaefer was born November 6, 1967, in Eugene, Oregon, and was the only child of parents Benson and Dana Schaefer. Rebecca was a tenacious, curious child, and whenever she was out with her family, all eyes would inevitably fall on her. She was a natural-born entertainer, and according to those who knew her, it was not hard to fall under her spell. 
She loved horseback riding, being outdoors, and especially excelled in school. But her passion was poetry. She found it easier to express herself through written language, and it was often found writing small poems to herself, like this one. There's a woman in the room, and she's standing very near. I can smell her sweet perfume, should I whisper in her ear. I don't know if she knows me, but I'm sure she likes me well. It's as though I've dropped a thousand pennies down a thousand wells. I can tell she's been with me, by her smile and her stare. The only difference between us is tis she that I did bear. Rebecca loved the act of writing and creating, finding it to be the most fulfilling thing she could do with her time. In her junior year of high school, Rebecca would be scouted while out with friends to pursue a career in modeling. Though her parents were apprehensive and not entirely trusting of the opportunity, believing it to either be a scam or an unsafe situation to put their daughter in, Rebecca went to her first photo shoot and was almost immediately successful. She was able to book multiple catalogs and commercials in her area, and was able to set aside more money than anyone had expected. According to multiple agents, she had the perfect natural look that they were after. She looked like the average American girl, sweet, innocent, and beautiful, but there was something incredibly disarming about her. She looked sincere, and according to one of her agents, she had a trustworthy charm that made people forget they were looking at an ad. Rebecca's modeling success led to more and more opportunities for her, and by August of 1984, when she was just 17 years old, Rebecca moved to New York by herself to elevate her career. She had outgrown the Oregon modeling world, and her agent informed her that New York was the obvious next step. She quickly signed with Elite Model Management and landed an acting role on the ABC soap opera One Life to Live, but in stark contrast to the beginning of her career, she struggled to find any substantial modeling work. Or she'd been able to book work in Oregon without issue, she found that she didn't fit the standard for models in the big city. In New York, the models were more high fashion. They were taller, leaner, and Rebecca was routinely passed over for jobs. When she would ask for feedback about why she wasn't right for certain campaigns, she received the same note. She simply didn't have the right look for the big city. In 1985, she moved to Japan, hoping her height would not be an issue, but she still struggled. She returned to New York nearly a year later and was encouraged to pursue acting instead of modeling by her agents. Rebecca had already starred in commercials and some television spots, and it was clear that she had a knack for the craft. Television casting directors were drawn to Rebecca for the same reason that model casting agents weren't. Again, she was described as beautiful, but in an unassuming way that they felt was perfect for network television. In 1986, she landed small roles in the film Radio Days, directed by Woody Allen, as well as the Steven Spielberg series Amazing Stories. These appearances garnered her a certain amount of recognition in the industry, and she began meeting with Hollywood producers, keen on creating projects around her. She was described as a delight to work with, and a consummate professional, always arriving on set before she was due, with her lines memorized and ready to go. Rebecca was encouraged to pursue sitcoms and episodic television, as being the star of a hit sitcom would mean consistent money for years to come. A network television spot was a coveted position, and with multiple Hollywood directors looking to find shows centered around Rebecca, she felt like she was finally on her way up. The first show she would be cast in was the sitcom My Sister Sam. She played the titular Sam's sister, Patty, who has to go live with her sister in San Francisco after their parents die unexpectedly. The show initially tested well and was tied for the 21st highest rated show in its first season. Though it wasn't as popular as other sitcoms of the time, it had potential, and Rebecca was able to land the cover of Seventeen magazine off of its success. However, season two was much less commercially successful. The show was unceremoniously moved to a Saturday night time slot, and viewership plummeted. After airing only 10 episodes of the 22-episode-long second season, CBS would cancel the show. She would go on to star in a plethora of other movies and shows, continuing to make significant connections in the industry. But on July 18, 1989, tragedy would strike. Robert John Bardo was born... January 2nd, 1970, and was the youngest of seven siblings. His father was a non-commissioned officer in the Air Force, and as such, his family moved frequently throughout his childhood. The constant upheaval was disorienting for Bardo, and he stated he never truly felt stable in his home. According to certain sources, John's mother was severely mentally ill and was unable to take care of any of her children. Likewise, his father was an alcoholic, and neither parent cared that John was being abused by an older sibling. 
The abuse got so bad that while at school, John told a teacher that he planned to kill himself because of it. Immediately, he was taken out of the family home and put in foster care for a short while. John's teachers would describe him as a time bomb on the verge of exploding, and would cite multiple instances where they became the target of his ire. He was intelligent and a skilled writer, but when he was faced with minimal correction, he would become incensed. At times, his teachers feared for their safety and the safety of the other students in the class. On multiple occasions, he wrote long, detailed letters threatening his teachers for how they spoke to him and vowing revenge. These letters and continuous threats would lead John to being institutionalized twice, with his medical records citing severe emotional damages. He underwent a number of psychiatric evaluations, the results of which led to the conclusion he was severely emotionally handicapped and his family was pathological and dysfunctional. Bardo was also diagnosed with bipolar disorder. But Bardo's emotional outbursts weren't specific to those around him. Samantha Smith was an American schoolgirl who gained international attention during the Cold War era in the 1980s. Born on June 29, 1972, Samantha became known for her efforts to promote peace and understanding between the United States and the Soviet Union. In 1982, at the age of 10, Samantha wrote a letter to the newly appointed General Secretary of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union, Yuri Andropov. In her letter, she expressed her concerns about the possibility of nuclear war between the two superpowers. Samantha's heartfelt letter received considerable media attention and captured the public's interest both in the United States and the Soviet Union. Impressed by her letter, Yuri personally responded to Samantha, inviting her to visit the Soviet Union and see the country for herself. Samantha accepted the invitation and embarked on a goodwill tour of the Soviet Union in July 1983. During her visit, she met with Yuri, toured various Soviet cities, and was warmly received by the Soviet people. Samantha's visit and her message of peace resonated with people around the world, most notably John Bardo. He obsessively poured over all the coverage of Samantha and became enamored with her. He believed she was perfect and that they were destined to be together. And so, at the age of 13 years old, he attempted to take a bus from Arizona to Maine to meet her. Ultimately, he was unsuccessful, but his obsession with the 10-year-old didn't end there. Unfortunately, Samantha would die in a plane crash at the age of 13, and Bardo's plans of stalking her would ultimately be dashed. At the age of 15, Bardo dropped out of school and began working as a janitor at a local jack-in-the-box. He hated the job, and his co-workers did what they could to keep their distance from the volatile teenager. On numerous occasions, he would have loud, disruptive outbursts, screaming at someone over a minuscule issue, and they knew better than to engage with him. It was at this job where Bardo first saw Rebecca. The fast food establishment kept a television on to entertain guests. During one of his shifts, an episode of My Sister Sam came on. At once, Bardo was transfixed by Schaefer. He thought she was beautiful and was immediately drawn to her the way he had been to Samantha. He is quoted as saying, She came into my life at the right moment. She was brilliant, pretty, outrageous. Her innocence impressed me. She turned into a goddess for me, an idol. Since then, I turned into an atheist. I only adored her. He began to write her long, emotional letters, pouring his heart out to the actress and telling her what her work meant to him. And shortly after sending the first one, Rebecca sent back a letter to Robert, thanking him for the kind words and stating that his letter was the most beautiful thing she had ever received. Oh, fuck. This wasn't uncommon for Rebecca. When she first started receiving fan mail, she felt overwhelmed with gratitude. Her work allowed her to touch so many people, to make an impact on their lives, and the fact that they had spent time writing to her, encouraging her, and supporting her career often brought her to tears. She spent hours corresponding with fans, wanting to ensure that they knew that she saw their letters and that their voices mattered. She had no idea that John would take that one correspondence and build a reality around it. The day he received her letter, Bardo wrote in his diary, quote, When I think of her, I would like to become famous to impress her. Shortly thereafter, Bardo would drive from Arizona to Burbank, having found out what studio My Sister Sam was produced at. He believed that Rebecca would be happy to see him, that when he arrived, he would be ushered into the studio, to her trailer, and they would be able to talk in person for the first time. But that was not the case. When he arrived to the lot, carrying a dozen red roses and a teddy bear that was over five feet tall, security immediately stopped him. He immediately told them that he knew Rebecca, and that she would know him, but they repeatedly stated he was not allowed in the studio, it was not going to be allowed on the lot. 
The following month, he returned to the lot, this time armed with a knife, and was once again turned away. Schaefer herself was never made aware of Bardo's attempts to see her, or the fact that he brought a knife to the lot. After My Sister Sam was cancelled, Bardo continued to write Schaefer letters, and consumed every piece of media she starred in. He collected every promotional photograph that he could of the starlet, and plastered them around his home. He talked about Rebecca to everyone he could, and in one letter to his sister, he stated that if he couldn't be with her, then he wouldn't allow anyone else to. That summer, Rebecca would have a small role in the movie Scenes from the Class Struggle in Beverly Hills. The movie contained a sex scene featuring her character, and after seeing the movie in theaters, Bardo was enraged. He would go on to write in his diary that she had become one more of the bitches of Hollywood, and he felt sickened by her. He felt as if she had tainted their relationship, and now, when he looked at her, all he felt was fury. He wrote pages upon pages about his anger, and he felt that she had sullied their relationship and how she needed to pay for her offenses. He drew diagrams of her body and marked where he would shoot her if he got the chance, and he asked his older brother to get him a gun, which of course he ultimately did. Shortly thereafter, he went back to Hollywood, this time determined to meet her. On July 15th, 1989, he attempted to find out where she lived through her agent. He called the agent's office and claimed to be a producer who wanted to put Rebecca in a movie. He asked if he could have her contact information, more specifically her address, but the agent rebuffed him, seeing through the ruse easily. He carried around a picture of Rebecca and roamed the streets of Hollywood, asking strangers if they had seen her or knew where she lived. Eventually, he paid a private detective $250 to track down her address, and within a few days, he knew exactly where she lived. On July 18, 1989, Robert John Bardo drove to Rebecca's apartment and rang her doorbell. Her intercom was broken at the time, so Rebecca walked down the apartment steps to see who was there. Rebecca was preparing to audition for a role in The Godfather Part 3, and was awaiting the delivery of a script prior to her meeting with director Francis Ford Coppola. Upon seeing Bardo, Schaefer was thrown off. She opened the door, believing that he had to have been delivering the script. But when he told her who he was, and showed her the letter that she had previously sent to him, along with an autographed photo, she rebuffed his advances. She thanked him for being a fan, but asked him not to come to her home again, and to kindly not write her anymore. At that point, she closed the door to the apartments, and went back inside. John was incensed. He believed that Rebecca had been in love with him, that she knew who he was, and that she would apologize for her vulgar sex scene. He thought she would be kind, tell him how much it meant to her to drive from Arizona, and to pay a P.I. to find her house. He never expected to be told to leave, and not come back. Angry and confused, Bardo walked to a nearby diner, where he had breakfast, before deciding to kill Schaefer. After he finished eating, he walked back to the apartment and rang Schaefer's doorbell. Once more, she came downstairs, and when she opened the door, he shot her directly in the chest. A neighbor heard the commotion, but by the time he got outside to see what had happened, John had already fled the scene. He called the police and tried to aid Rebecca, but shortly after being taken to Cedar Sinai, she was pronounced dead. John successfully fled the scene and was able to get back to Arizona, but the following day, he was found on the highway, wandering through traffic, screaming that he had killed Rebecca. When he was eventually picked up by police, he stated that he'd been trying to kill himself by jumping in front of oncoming cars, stating he owed it to Rebecca to die. After Bardo was arrested, he was charged with Schaefer's murder, and while his lawyers conceded that he had killed the young actress, they argued that he was not guilty due to his severe mental health issues. They argued in court that he did not have the capacity to plan and execute a murder, and therefore should only be charged with second-degree homicide. However, all the evidence said otherwise. Bardo had taken hundreds of notes, declaring his dangerous obsession for Rebecca, stating that he loved her, and that if he couldn't be with her, he would kill her. He told his relatives about how he planned to be with her. He made diagrams about where to shoot her if she ever rejected him, and he had paid hundreds of dollars to find her exact address. Bardo was eventually convicted of murder in the first degree and sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. As of time of recording, he is 53 years old and will serve the rest of his life sentence at a venal state prison in California. Disturbingly, he sells his own artwork online, which includes artwork of Rebecca. 
following Rebecca's murder, federal law regarding the release of personal information through the DMV was changed. The private investigator that John had hired had been able to obtain her personal address by simply going to the DMV and filling out a form. A few years after her murder, the Driver's Privacy Protection Act was passed, which prohibits the disclosure of personal information without the express consent of the person to whom such information applies. Schaefer's death also helped prompt the 1990 passing of America's first anti-stalking laws. The following is a poem that Rebecca wrote shortly before her death. If tomorrow I suddenly discover I had wings, I'd take you with me and we could fly around. Why must we leave this created place to see the light? If you've made it to this portion of the video, thank you for watching. If you would like to see more of our content on your feed, be sure to like and subscribe. If there is a case you would like to see discussed, or a story you want more attention brought to, email me at dreading.official at gmail.com. As always, have a great day, and remember to stay safe.